Everything that is without Christ cannot completely satisfy us, fulfill us. Ultimate fulfillment we'll get when we meet him in heaven. But if Jesus gives you water, if he gives you himself, his grace, then you, you will no longer be thirsty. Jesus had to pass through Samaria because he came to earth for a reason. And he, one of the reasons, or the main reasons, he says himself in Luke 19.10. Maybe a familiar uh, verse for you. But Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. This is the heart of Christ. Jesus, unlike Jews, practices God's second commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. He loves Samaritan woman and her people. His grace extends to all people, to all nations, and all, to all levels of society. Notice how Jesus starts a conversation between him and the Samaritan woman. Look with me in verse 7. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. The Samaritan woman is shocked that Jesus is talking to her. Not only is she Samaritan, but we also said that Jews, we said that Jews, Jews do not associate with Samaritans, but she's also a woman. And in Jewish culture at that time, it was not customary for men to talk to a woman outside his family. Not to mention from other culture, let alone Samaritan women. Even disciples were surprised that Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman. Later on in verse 27, look with me what he says. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Disciples were surprised, as we already said, that she was a Samaritan, that she was a woman. Jesus was a rabbi. But maybe even more important, they were surprised because they did not understand Christ's mission, why he came. And this is so important. How many followers today, globally, understand what is the mission of God? What is the mission of Christ? Do you sometimes see yourselves as the disciples in this story? Do you sometimes look down on people? We are all capable of this. Do you understand or do you know what the mission is? We heard it today, actually. Our mission comes from the Great Commission passage to make disciples. That's our mission for the church. Do you pursue, pursue people? Do you seek people, relationships, so you can bring Christ to them? To see them come to faith in Christ. So this is one of the example, uh, opportunities for you guys as this camp starts this summer. From this example, brothers and sisters, we can see that the Lord's perspective is often very different from people's perspective, and maybe even our own perspective. Nevertheless, despite us, the Lord is looking for us. And that leads me to my second point of the message. Christ initiates grace and love in our lives despite our sin. Despite our sin. And that is not logical. Because if we are sinners, God should not have nothing to do with you and me. This is what the world thinks. God could never love me. They think it's impossible. They think they need to get rid of all of their sin for Jesus to love them. But no, despite your sin and mine, Jesus begins a, a, a grace in your lives. Here in this text, we see that the Samaritan woman lived in sin. She did not deserve the gospel. She did not deserve gospel. Look with me in verses 16 to 18 again. He told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. What is Jesus doing here? Jesus is exposing Samaritan woman to what she already knows, her sin. She knows she's a sinner. In the second part of verse 6, it says that this dialogue took place around noon. Most people were not going to get water at noon. People fetch water in the morning when it's cold, when it's cool. 
But the Samaritan woman probably was aware of the, that she will be more ridiculed. She will be discriminated by her own people during the noon. So she went, uh, she went to, she would be discriminated in the morning. So she went in the noon. Sorry. But why, the question is, why does Jesus expose the sin of a Samaritan woman? I believe one of the reasons is that until she comes to a deeper, so that's the word important, deeper awareness that she's a sinner, she cannot become a follower of Christ. Many people outside this community, in, in Galloway, in uh, Ireland, might acknowledge that they're sinners. They might acknowledge. But they might justify right away, well, we're all sinners. We're all sinners. In other words, they might say to themselves, everybody's a sinner, so God might be merciful to me because I'm not as bad as my neighbor, maybe. But without realizing a deeper understanding that she, the Samaritan woman, is a sinner, and that because of her sin, she's, not, she's separated from God, the Samaritan woman cannot enter the kingdom of God, and not just her, but any person. Good news is a good news when a person realizes that he or she has a problem. Many people don't realize they have a problem. The point is not to just get Jesus. The point is to realize our issue first in order to accept Christ. Here we see how honest and direct the, our Lord is. Do you want a doctor who will tell you the truth about your diagnosis? Or you want a doctor who is going to be indirect and possibly this disease might kill you? Christ begins grace in our lives and saves us despite our sin, your and mine. And we see this in text, in this text, this example with Samaritan woman. Each of us had a different experience how we met Christ. Those of us who have. A long time I have a long time ago, it happened to me. Despite that I came from a poor situation, I did not deserve to go to the United States for college and hear the gospel and for Christ to give me new life. I did not even finish high school. I was handed a high school diploma. I never attended a church in my life until I went to the United States at age almost 22. I was a sinner and not deserving any grace and love for Christ. But in 96, in 1996, God orchestrated an incredible way that I go to the United States. The first crazy thing is that I was getting, I got full basketball scholarship even though no coach saw me play basketball. Usually, to get the full basketball scholarship, they have to see you personally playing basketball or at least some kind of video. But I didn't do any of that. Yet, I got a full offer to go to the United States. On top of that, I didn't speak any English. I had no money. I had a small car. It was worth $500. And the very last day that I needed to sell it, I somehow I sold it. I know, I know now how. My friend gave me another $500. But even having money, I still wasn't sure if I'm going. I lived in a small town four hours away from the capital city where I live now, where the embassy was. I had to get up 4 o'clock in the morning, get on that bus, practice a few sentences in English to interview an uh, embassy rep. I did not say bye to any of my friends, only to my family. Because I thought there was no way they gave me a visa. I don't speak in English. How can you go to college? I did not speak English, and I was facing this American rep, and he realized that I couldn't speak any, and apparently he learned some language. So he spoke to me in Croatian, and he also started speaking Croatian. I'm like, I mean, he was saying, like, I love basketball, and I was like, oh, maybe, this, maybe I got this. Maybe I'll get this. Eventually, I got, I got, I got the visa. I got the visa. God heavenly orchestrated this in my life. He initiated this process and provided so many details for me to come to hear the gospel in the United States to essentially become a follower of him and also a missionary to serve him here, I mean, in Croatia and in Europe and to bring the good news. But without grace that he initiated while I was a sinner and you were a sinner, neither you and I would have come to know him. And that brings me to my last point of the text, of the message today. 
The grace and love that Christ begins you and, in you and me is everlasting. It's forever. And from a hum, human standpoint of view, this also, this also doesn't make sense. Because God's grace and love should be conditional, conditional in how we live. And in some way, it is. I mean, if you live in sin completely, you're most likely not a believer. But if, if Jesus truly initiated grace and love in you, be sure it's forever. This is his promise in several texts, but in text today. Your and my salvation do not depend on us. Thank God for that. We will persevere until the, until the end because Jesus is faithful. And what he started in your and my life, he will complete. He will finish it. In this text, again, Jesus communicates with an unconverted woman, a Samaritan woman. And he communicates to her that when Jesus enters her life, it's forever. Look with me at the communication between Samaritan woman and Jesus about the very thing. Verses 13 and 14, once again. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them, here's the promise, will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. So Jesus says, whoever drinks this water will be thirsty again. The water that she draws from the well. So Jesus uses the image of water that is of this world. The pleasure of this world cannot fulfill you. Sex, drugs, alcohol, money, basketball, whatever. They always make you thirsty. They always make you come back for more. Everything that is without Christ cannot completely satisfy us, fulfill us. Ultimate fulfillment we'll get when we meet him in heaven. But if Jesus gives you water, if he gives you himself, his grace, then you, you will no longer be thirsty because he can satisfy you forever. Jesus said it twice. If, he give it, if I give it to them, to you, if it is from Christ, then you will never be thirsty again. And then he says it will result in eternal life, not life for a time, not life for sometimes, but to life eternal. And this refers to a person who did surrender his life to Christ. And your pastor prayed this morning that if any of you here haven't surrendered your life to Christ, we urge you to do so, to surrender to Christ, your life, because he's worthy, to trust in what he did on the cross for you and my sin. It's worth it. It's worth it. To conclude, our Lord is incredible. Despite your and my sin, he loves us and gives us grace. Even though we fall and fall again, he does not let us go. Why? Because he is faithful and you are not, are not always faithful. He never changes. You are not changed sometimes. He loves is unconditional for us who belong to him. Our love for others is not always like that. He who created the universe, Jesus himself, he who holds everything together in his hands will never forsake you. He will never leave you. Apostle Paul reminds us of that. That the Lord's love for you and me is wide, deep, and high, and that nothing can separate us from him. Romans 8, 38, 39. The Lord invites us to participate in his works here on earth. We're not just uh, watchers. We're not just uh, fans. He says that first we love him with all of our hearts, all of our soul, and all our mind. And then he says to love our neighbor and, uh, as ourselves. To love brothers and sisters in Christ. To love all people. To love even animals. I mean, oh, sorry, enemies. Well, you can love animal, animals. I got one home. <laughs> I'm, I'm, getting to, I'm getting to love her more and more. It's, it's a story for itself. But he sends us to participate in salvation of other people through preaching of the good news, proclaiming the good news, heralding good news. The very thing we saw in this passage, in his example of Christ. And he has prepared a work for us. And that was a reference, I think, by Carolyn today. In Ephesians 10, uh, 2.10 says that all of us 
have work that God prepared for us. He sends us in, in his authority. We see that in Great Commission. We're not, we're not proclaiming gospel and Christ in our authority. In his authority, he's sending us. And in that same passage in Great Commission, it says that he will always be with us. Our mission is to make disciples. That's our mission. But our motive is Christ and his glory. And that is why we see in this text that the grace and love that Christ initiates in a person, in you and me, including Samaritan woman that we see, surpasses human reason. Pray with me. Dear Lord, we thank you for this well-known yet inspiring passage and how you, Lord, has, have done it and showed us the way. Lord, thank you for inspiring us to, to connect with people all around us, no matter where they come from, no matter what layer of society they are. Thank you that you have changed our lives by the message of the gospel. May we be faithful, obedient to proclaim it, Lord, to people around us, to pursue people, to spend time with people, regardless of their response. Thank you for this opportunity and privilege to be co-workers alongside you. Because we know that we cannot convert anybody. That is your job. The job is just to be faithful and obedient. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.